May 10, 1968, despite low expectations, peace talks began between the U.S. and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Negotiations stagnated for five months as America looked for a new leader. To replace Johnson as president, the Democrats selected Vice President Hubert Humphrey. Running against him was Republican Richard Nixon. Through an intermediary, Nixon advised Saigon to refuse to participate in the talks until after the election, claiming that he would give them a better deal once elected. The Vietnamese obliged. This meant almost no progress was made by the time Johnson left office. Vietnam destroyed Johnson's presidency, and his refusal to send more U.S. troops to Vietnam was seen as an admission that the war was lost. As Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara noted, the dangerous illusion of victory by the United States was therefore dead. But it's a new war, because now we're not going to, we have to fight at, a, at the level we're, we're at, or even at a reduced level, because Nixon does introduce troop withdrawals. Uh, so that represents a major change. And also from now on, you're engaging in what the North Vietnamese fought, call fighting while negotiating. You've got the war continuing. In fact, uh, uh, one historian calls, uh, calls the year after Tet, February 68 to February 69, the bloodiest year of the war. And it is on all sides. The, the casualties are huge. Uh, but uh, it, it's still, it's still stalemated. And you've got negotiations, of course, going on in Paris, too. You've got these two sides to it that have to be kept in balance some way. It's a much more complicated war up to this point. It's a much harder war for Americans to s sustain morale because there's no longer any sense that, that this war is going to be won in a conventional sense. There, there is a sense that you're fighting a holding action to try to get the best possible settlement you can and then get out. Well, anybody that's ever carried a, a rifle in harm's way uh, thinks the war he fought was the toughest war. Anybody that's been shot at is satisfied. Uh, Winston Churchill said that the, uh, the sublimest experience a man can have is to be shot out in anger without incident. But I do think the Vietnam War, particularly after I was there, after 69, when we began to know, you can't fool the troops. Nixon ran for president on a platform based on a secret plan to end the war. That promise gave him a narrow victory over Humphrey. Once in the White House, Nixon began to institute his plan for Vietnamization of the war. Nixon's plan appeared to be simple. The U.S. was to build up the Arvin so that they could take over the defense of South Vietnam. The policy had much in common with the policies of the Kennedy administration. One important difference remained. Kennedy insisted that the South Vietnamese fight the war themselves. By doing this, he attempted to limit the scope of the conflict. Severe communist losses during the Tet Offensive allowed Nixon to begin troop withdrawals from Vietnam, even before reaching an agreement at the peace conference. The U.S. combat role now shifted to smaller operations, aimed at communist logistics, with better use of firepower and more cooperation with the Arvin. What General Abrams does after Tet is to better integrate smaller search and destroy operations with pacification. So really under him for the first time there is a more systematic, better coordinated effort to, to sort of make, and I'm sure you're getting into it in other interviews, but the thing that really stands out is there are all kinds of things going on here and there, but they're not very well coordinated. And Abrams tries to bring some coordination to this. But of course, uh, what's happening at the same time is that Nixon initiates troop withdrawals and, and continues troop withdrawals. And so that uh, more and more the uh, the uh, ground operations are shifted to the South Vietnamese, uh, supported up through the Easter Offensive by U.S. air power. There was one other change in the face of the war. 
In September 1969, Ho Chi Minh, the grand old father figure to the people of Vietnam, died at age 79. After the Tet Offensive, the nature of ground combat changed in Vietnam. After Tet, we, we, uh, well, things slowed down. Things slowed down. I mean, we were, you know, making contact, making contact, making contact. And then after the Tet, the major, you know, a major impact there at Wade City and everything. And uh, it, there was no VC left. It was almost like he, he ceased to exist. And all the contact we made after that was with the NVA. The VC was just about done for. We had just had the cadres that they had attacked us with, we had just annihilated. You know, uh, not, not just us, but the Army and, you know, and, and, and everybody else. We just wiped them out. We broke their back. At Tet, we broke their back. We had them on their knees at Tet. And then the NVA took over, you know, for most of the uh, insurgency. There toward, uh, of course, I, I can't tell you what happened down, you know, south of Da Nang. You know, all I can tell you is north, you know, in the I Corps area. That's where we were at. And uh, all contact after that was NBA. And uh, we've probably been better off with the BC. <laughs> they, were, uh, they were better professional force. You know, they were, they were almost, almost back to your World War II, you know, a uh, big unit against big unit. Uh, I think our, our, our big, rival at that time was like the 324th B NBA uh, battalion and they were they you know they were tough people. Operation codename Dewey Canyon was the last major offensive by the United States Marine Corps during the Vietnam War. Beginning on January 22nd, the 9th, reinforced by elements of the 3rd Marine Regiment, was to make a 56-day sweep of the NBA dominated Asha Valley. The NVA was a was a top-notch, you know, uh, military unit. They had they had their structure, you know, they had their cadres. They they had good people. They had good people, and uh, they weren't something that you could just brush off. They were they were professional soldiers. A lot of them had more experience than we did. Um, we had uh, um, d devices called SIDs, I think, uh, was the name for it, and they were fake trees. Um, they didn't look much better than the, the ferns you'd get out at Kmart or something, but it was um, basically an electronic jungle penetrator. And I seem to recall they were about three feet long, and they were motion sensors. And they would try to drop these uh, from helicopters so that they were more accurate and land them close to main trail intersections or heavily traveled trails, but far enough back into the jungle uh, that they wouldn't be uh, spotted. They, they weren't real realistic looking. They were painted, uh, camouflaged, and they had plastic leaves coming out the tail end of them and everything so that they would, if you just caught it out of the corner of your eye, you might mistake it for a live plant. Um, but they were sensors in that they would uh, I guess be so sensitive that they could detect people walking down the trail if there was a large group of them or, or certainly could detect uh, wheeled or tracked vehicles. Um, and then they would send an electronic signal back to whoever was monitoring that van. When Lieutenant General Raymond G. Davis took command of the 3rd Marine Division, he ordered Marine units to move out of their combat bases and engage the enemy. He had noted that the manning of the bases and the defensive posture they developed was contrary to the aggressive style of fighting that Marines favor. Operation Dewey Canyon was conducted in three phases, with raids into Laos being the third and final phase. The Marines encountered stiff resistance throughout the conduct of the operation, most of which was fought under triple canopy jungle and within range of NVA artillery based in Laos. Almost immediately, the Marines ran into the NVA. In fact, the 1st Battalion bumped right into a force of enemy preparing for a ground assault on Firebase Erskine. Heavy fighting raged for several hours before the NVA withdrew. 
Many times in Vietnam, the, the enemy was elusive because uh, unless it was a set staged battle, uh, you had two or three snipers off in a tree line and they'd shoot and move on. Uh, you would attack the tree line and uh, very rarely found anything at all. Uh, all. Every so often you may find some blood trails, but uh, hardly any bodies. The rifle companies continued their sparring with the enemy as they pushed farther south through the thick, triple canopy jungle. Company K was particularly hard hit on February 16th when North Vietnamese forces attacked it from both the front and the rear. On the morning of 18 February, Company A fought a pitched battle with NVA ensconced in reinforced bunkers dug into a heavily forested ridgeline. Following air and artillery strikes, the grunts finally overwhelmed the force, killing 30 NVA while losing one Marine. When the fight ended, 71 dead NVA were added to operations body count. Five Marines died and 28 were wounded. On February 20th, to the west of the 1st Battalion fights, two 2nd Battalion units finally reached positions that overlooked Route 922 and the international border. The men of Companies E and H could actually see enemy convoys moving on the dirt road below them. Until now, the Allies had been forbidden from crossing the international border. General Davis sent the request to cross into Laos to 3rd MAF, who in turn forwarded it to MACV. General Abrams' response was short and to the point. He said no. However, on the afternoon of February 21st, a classified message authorizing an ambush on Highway 922 was received by the 9th Marines. By midnight on February 22nd, the Marines were in place in the thick brush that lay between the dirt road and a paralleling stream. We'd set up an ambush and usually put our, our uh, we set it up and finally, you almost always have to see the spot during the day and then go back and at night set up the ambush. And what we'd like to do is go out with a bigger party and then drop off as we go like toward evening and set up the ambush. We put out claymores, you know, the mines and uh, we put a machine gun out on the, uh, on the apex of it, you know, to block any uh, uh, escape for the enemy. And uh, then he'd sit and wait in the rain or, or heat. But usually it was, we'd stay out of, usually all night, come back in the next morning. We also call in, you know, give them, let them know where our, uh, our principal direction of fire and our uh, our, our artillery grids if we needed back up and stuff like that. And it's just being out there alone for so long a period of time. And I think it's a, it's a, it kind of wears on your nerves, but to tell you the truth, it's kind of a, what would you say, it's kind of a, a rush too, an adrenaline rush, especially if you get somebody in the, in the ambush itself. But on the other side, it's not very good. <laughs> At 0230, a convoy of eight enemy trucks entered the kill zone. The ambush began with the firing of a Claymore mine. With a loud roar and a cloud of inky black smoke, thousands of steel balls shredded the second truck and its occupants. An instant later, a cacophony of M16 and M60 fire exploded from the brush. And the Marine Corps is noted for their fire superiority in advance. And I don't care how much fire is coming at you when your squad leader says, move out. You got up and you put the fire because if they're ducking, they're not shooting. The firing continued for several minutes. An eerie quiet then descended on the jungle road. Eight dead North Vietnamese were found. Three of the trucks were completely destroyed. Not a single Marine was injured. Satisfied with their work, the Marines vanished back into the jungle. By mid-morning, they had rejoined the rest of the company on the top of the ridge. Once safely back inside South Vietnam, word of the cross-border incursion swiftly made its way up the chain of command.
permission to expand operations in Laos against enemy forces using Highway 922 was granted. Before the Marines could move back into Laos, heavy fighting erupted in the 1st Battalion's area. After advancing just a short distance through the thick jungle, the grunts ran smack into a reinforced NVA company, occupying well-prepared, mutually supporting bunkers. Uh, we were going to move all night and be in a certain area come daylight. Well, um, sometime during the night, and I couldn't tell you exactly what time it was, uh, we walked into a U-shaped ambush. The North Vietnamese and Viet Cong were set up. They knew we were coming. Um, we have pictures that we acquired from them later of our operation that we were on. But uh, we walked right into a U-shaped ambush that they sprang. Um, we were virtually fighting all night long. As the Marines maneuvered forward, NVA machine guns, RPGs, and mortars placed on a ridgeline behind them suddenly opened up. Unable to use air support because of bad weather or artillery support due to the close proximity of the enemy, the Marines knew that they had to maintain the momentum of the attack. The grunts fought valiantly in the bitter, close quarters combat that followed. The fight was the last major engagement of Operation Dewey Canyon. The fight yielded 105 dead NVA and more than two dozen automatic weapons captured. However, the victory came at a high price. I didn't know that a person could get so low to the ground to you know, hide behind rice paddy dikes and things like that. Um, out of the 250 of us, and this is captains and lieutenants, uh, we even had a major military uh, artillery uh, forward observer. Um, by the time daylight came, there was 33 of us left standing, um, and the senior ranking person was a corporal, E-4. Everybody else had either been hit, was dead, or wounded, and uh, we ended up taking, you know, taking the tree line, but uh, not before some heavy casualties. Final results for Operation Dewey Canyon tallied 1,617 enemy killed and huge quantities of supplies, weapons, and munitions destroyed. The 9th Marines lost 130 killed and 920 wounded in their last major operation of the war. But for those losses, the Marines greatly disrupted the enemy's presence in this border region and blocked his ability to move on major civilian and military targets to the east. The war was the central issue of the 1972 presidential election. Nixon's opponent, George McGovern, campaigned on a platform of withdrawal from Vietnam. The president's national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, continued secret negotiations with North Vietnam's Le Duc Tho in an attempt to break the deadlock before the election. In October 1972, they reached an agreement. However, South Vietnamese President Thu demanded massive changes to the peace accord. When North Vietnam went public with the agreement's details, the Nixon administration claimed that the North was attempting to embarrass the president. The negotiations became deadlocked once again as Hanoi demanded new changes. To show his support for South Vietnam and force Hanoi back to the negotiating table, Nixon ordered Operation Linebacker II, a massive bombing of Hanoi and Haiphong. What, well, Operation Linebacker is a result, it, it's the so-called Christmas bombing, and it occurs uh, over the Christmas holidays, 1972, and it results from the breakdown of negotiations in Paris that occurs, oh, it's so clear. <laughs> there is an, an agreement, is Kissinger negotiates an agreement with North Vietnam acceptable to both sides in 1972. 
in the fall of 1972. The only problem, of course, is that Nguyen Van Tu of South Vietnam sees very clearly that if this agreement goes into effect, uh, that it's going to be suicide for South Vietnam and for Nguyen Van Tu himself. Uh, so he objects to the agreement, understandably objects to the agreement, and ultimately it's his objections that break down the agreement that Kissinger and Le Ducteau had negotiated. Uh, they go back to Paris. Uh, the North Vietnamese are not about to accept most of the changes that Tu asked for, some of which the United States supports. The negotiations break down, and Nixon in sort of final, a final spasm of the war, uh, orders the uh, uh, heavy bombing, B-52 bombing of uh, Hanoi in uh, December of 72. It has a significant impact in North Vietnam, obviously causes a lot of destruction. It causes outrage across the world. It causes uh, uh, consternation in Congress. Uh, I think there's no doubt, as some have claimed, that it helps to bring North Vietnam back to the conference table. In January of 73, to pretty much go back to the October, the essentials of the October agreement, uh, but it also puts tremendous pressure on Nixon to settle, uh, which is often left out of the picture. There are heavy losses in the early stages of the, uh, of the air campaign, losses of B-52s. Although McGovern himself was not elected U.S. president, the November 1972 election did return a Democratic majority to both houses of Congress under McGovern's Come Home America campaign theme. Even more, the uh, Christmas bombing arouses such outrage in so many quarters that Nixon realizes that if he doesn't get some kind of an agreement, that uh, Congress is going to take things, take control out of his hands uh, and use uh, methods it had not used up to this time to, in effect, stop the war. The offensive destroyed much of the remaining economic and industrial capacity of North Vietnam. Simultaneously, Nixon pressured Tu to accept the terms of the agreement, threatening to conclude a bilateral peace deal and cut off American aid. On January 15, 1973, Nixon announced the suspension of offensive action against North Vietnam. The Paris Peace Accords on Ending the War and Restoring Peace in Vietnam were signed on January 27, 1973 officially ending direct U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. A ceasefire was declared across North and South Vietnam. U.S. POWs were released and U.S. forces began to pack up. On March 29, 1973, two months after signing the Vietnam Peace Agreement, the last U.S. combat troops left South Vietnam. The Marines' longest war came to an end but it was not the end of the Marines in Vietnam.